consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I grew up, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Like newborn babies crave beautiful meal, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. We're in the third week of our series called Faith for Grown-Ups. And what we're doing is we're talking about what is faith really all about? And, and what we've talked about the last few weeks is more important than defining like what faith is, is understanding the object of your faith. Because faith is ultimately a relational term. Faith has to do with how we relate to the object of our faith. And in some ways, we all put our faith in something or someone to give us uh, meaning or significance or purpose or, or happiness. And so faith in that person or in that thing is ultimately in how we relate to that. And so with that in mind, here's how we at FCC, here's how we've chosen to define Christian faith. This is the definition we're using, we're using for faith. Faith is living as if Jesus is who he said he is. The Christian faith is ultimately about how we relate to Jesus. So if we're going to live as people of faith, it means we're living as if Jesus is who he says he is. And the thing about faith, because it's relational, because it has to do with how we relate to Jesus, it's never static. Our faith is never just stationary. Faith is always either growing or dying because the same is true with relationships. Any relationship you have, it's either growing or it's declining. Jesus tells a story in Luke 8 about uh, uh, someone scattering seed on different kinds of soil. And as Jesus tells the story, he says, hey, some of the seed fell on soil that, that the seed took root and plants started to grow, but the soil wasn't really healthy. It was shallow. And so it grew real quick, but then it died real quick. And some of the other seed falls on soil that it doesn't even take root in. It's just dry, dead soil. There's no root. Nothing ever happens. It just dies right away. And some of the other seed falls on good soil and the seed goes down and it develops a root system and it grows and it's a healthy, thriving plant. Now, ultimately, that story that Jesus tells is a story about faith. And, and what he's talking about is he's saying, listen, faith, sometimes it grows up really quick and then it dies out because it doesn't have the roots. Sometimes it never even grows at all. Sometimes it grows deep and it's strong and it, it's big. But it's a story ultimately about faith. And, and, and it gets to exactly to that point, to faith is either, is either growing or it's declining. And declining faith, if it keeps going that way, will ultimately always die. And so as we're talking about faith, and, and if we're saying, okay, faith is never static, it's either growing or declining, it's either growing or dying, the first question is, what does growing faith look like? How can I look at my own life and say, yes, my faith is growing? Paul defines this for us in a letter that he writes to the church in Galatia. We call it Galatians. And in Galatians 5, through 23, here's what he writes. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. This is what God produces in us. Spirit is a way of referring to presence. And so Paul says, hey, this is what growing faith looks like. If you and I are experiencing growing faith, if we're living as if Jesus is who he says he is, and we're experiencing growing faith, this is what our life will look like. We will have more love and more joy and more peace and forbearance and kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, some people I know, they're like, oh, my faith is great, my faith, but they're, they're becoming angrier and more bitter and more upset and more judgmental. And Paul comes along and says, no, 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 no. Your knowledge may be growing, your experience may be growing, but not your faith. The only way you know if your faith is growing is if this is what your life looks like. If consistently, more and more each day, doesn't mean every day is perfect, doesn't mean we knock it out of the park every day, but if as you look back, if, if I'm more like this than I was two months ago, three months ago, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, if I'm more like this than I was back then, then my faith is growing. Faith is a very, very practical thing. So this is what growing faith looks like. So if we're saying that faith is never static, it's either growing or dying, this is what growing faith looks like. Okay, well on the other end, 
well, what about what about dying faith? And and in one way you could say, well, you know, dying faith is the opposite of this. But when you look culturally, when you look, we're, we're a part of what's known as the Western world. And when you look at the Western world, it's it's more and more described as becoming post-Christian. In a lot of ways, you could argue that that faith, particularly Christian faith, but I would say just faith in general, is is kind of declining and dying in general in the Western world. When Gallup poll first started measuring religious membership in the U.S., they did it for the first time in 1937, what they found is that 73% of people who live in the U.S. Um, were, were members of some kind of religious organization, religious institution. And what's fascinating is for the next six decades, that number hovered pretty close to, to, to right around 70 there. Sometimes it would dip down to like 68, 69. Sometimes it would go up and be a little bit higher in the 70s. But for six decades, it hovered right there at around 70%. But then when you hit the early 2000s, it started this like drastic decline. And so now it sits at 47% which is the lowest ever for, for religious involvement in the history of our nation. And even that's just what people identify with on, a, on like a survey. When you actually look at practicing faith, people who practice their faith, who it makes a difference in their daily life, that number is, is even lower. And so you can look at that and say, hey man, it looks like in general that, that faith, at least in, in a Western context, is dying. And, and there's all different kinds of reasons you could point out for that. You could go through and you could look at cultural reasons or, you know, socioeconomic reasons. But I think there's one really subtle reason that's kind of like underneath the radar that contributes to why faith, and again, in this space, in this area, we're talking about specifically Christian faith, why Christian faith in the Western world is kind of on, on the decline. Richard Beck, who's a, a professor and an author, he says this in his book, Hunting Magic Eels. He says, in many ways, Protestantism has been a journey from the mystical to the moral. If God is slowly dying, it's because Christians stopped seeking God and started to focus on being good. For Protestants, liberal or conservative, morality and politics are central and on the front burner. Encountering God is increasingly an afterthought if it's a thought at all. And so what Beck is, is highlighting, he says it pretty clearly there, is he says, listen, Christianity in its origin was about this, this connection with God. And specifically with Jesus, who was it's God in the flesh. And he came to earth and he died and he rose again and, and he ascended back up into heaven. And so Christianity historically was always about this, this kind of pursuit and living in connection with God. But what he notes in, in Protestantism, which begins in like the Protestant Reformation, like in uh, several hundred years ago, is that Protestantism ultimately in the Western world begins to move more toward just strictly behaviors. And it's about morality and it's, it's about what you do. And that's where he says it, it made that transition from it's no longer mystical, it's moral. Now understand, Beck isn't saying that morality is bad. He's not saying we shouldn't be moral. That's, that's not his point at all. Morality is good and we should live moral lives. But what he's saying is, is that the pursuit of Christianity is not first and foremost about morals. I mean, go, go back, go back to the, the description that Paul gives of what growing faith looks like. Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, forbearance, all that other stuff. The way that Paul defines growing faith is he said, growing faith is the fruit that the presence of God develops within you. So the question is, well, how does God develop those, those qualities within you? How does God develop those characteristics? How does God develop that character within you? Here's what Jesus says in John 15. He's talking to his, his closest followers, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. And so as Jesus is talking to his followers, he makes it really clear. He says, listen, this is what this whole thing is all about. It's about you remaining in me. It's about us remaining together. Other translations use the word abide. I think that's a great word, abide. Jesus makes it clear that that Christian faith, what what he's all about, what he's doing is about us living in connection with, with God. Jesus says, look, if you don't live in connection with God, then you're just like a branch, that, like a dead branch. You can't do anything. See, Jesus says, when you, remain, when you live in me, when you abide in me, this is how you bear fruit. 
So all that stuff that Paul talks about in Galatians when he says, hey, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. This is what growing faith looks like. That is the result of us living with Jesus. See, the pursuit, the pursuit of Christian faith is that we live with Jesus. Now the result, the outcome of living with Jesus is all of these different, the, the, this transformation that we experience, the, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the result, but that's not the pursuit. And what Richard Beck is highlighting is he's saying, listen, here's the problem in, in Western Christianity, particularly in Protestantism and American Christianity, is we've kind of gotten rid of that mystical pursuing Jesus and we've made it all about the pursuit of morality. And we've made Christianity, well, Christianity is about doing this and doing that and not doing this and doing that. And Christianity is about voting this way or having this opinion or having that opinion. And so we've made it this moral thing. We've lost the mystical. And the problem is when you make the behavior the goal, you will never attain it. Never. Because how many times, think about this, how many times of your own life have you gotten frustrated with some some character flaw in you, some behavior in you. I don't like how I get frustrated with my wife, or I don't like the way I talk to my kids, or I don't like that I do this, or I don't like that I do that. I don't like my eating patterns. I don't like my exercising habits, whatever it is. And you think to yourself, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. This is going to be different from this point on. And you try as hard as you can, (laughs) and you fail every time. Because the harder we try, just the more and more we fail. That's why it gets really discouraging. That's why people give up. That's why we give in to like despair and hopelessness. Because as hard as we try, we can't ever achieve the things that we want to do. Paul even writes about this in the New Testament. He says, I, I'm frustrated with myself. Because I can't do all the things I want to do. And I, I do all the things I don't want to do. That's part of being a, a human being. And so if all we're trying to do is do the things that we think, hey, this is the Christian thing to do. This is the Christian behavior. This is the Christian way to think. This is the Christian. If that's our pursuit, then we end up becoming Pharisees. In the New Testament uh, world that that Jesus lived in, in, in first century Israel, Pharisees were like religious leaders. They were incredibly legalistic. They were incredibly judgmental. They were incredibly condemning. And, And Jesus always had conflict with them. They couldn't stand Jesus. They saw Jesus as a threat to their tradition and to their values. They, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him. In, in Matthew 23, as Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and specifically the faith of the Pharisees and how they practice their faith as the pursuit of morality, as the pursuit of, hey, this is, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. Here's what Jesus says. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. See, Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, you're you're missing the whole point. That yeah, you make the outside so important, the outside, all these behaviors, all these things that you have to do, all these, these things that you're supposed to do. But inside, he said, man, it's just, it's, it's hypocrisy and it's greed and it's selfishness. And understand that Jesus is, is in no way, he's not questioning like the sincerity of the Pharisees. Like they're very sincere. These are people that try really hard to live by the law and to do all the right things and to do everything that you're supposed to do because they want to please God. Ultimately, they're kind of trying to earn love and salvation from God. But Jesus comes along and says, no, you're missing the whole point. Because the point was never to strive to be this this great person that does all these things. Jesus said the point was to strive to pursue God. And then as you pursue God, then all of this other stuff begins to happen. Your character begins to become transformed. Inside you become transformed. You become a person that's more defined by love and joy and peace and patience. Then your character develops. Then you experience transformation. That's when your morality comes. Your morality, the way you live, your lifestyle, your character, is the result of pursuing God. If you get it the other way around, it will fail every single time. If your faith, if your Christian faith is about pursuing specific behavior, it will not work. It, you may be able to fake it for a short period of time, but in the long haul, it will not work. And if, you, if, if for parents, let me just tell you this, if, you, if, if what you're teaching your kids is that, that Christian faith is about their behavior, they're going to walk away from it one day. 
because it will not work. It never does. It doesn't bring fullness. It doesn't bring joy. It doesn't bring love. Faith has always been about pursuing Jesus. And so what, we're, what we want to do at FCC and kind of what the whole reason that we're doing this series is we're trying to reclaim like what really is Christian faith all about? Christian faith has become so complicated in the world and the culture in which we live. We're trying to boil it down to like in its essence, what does it mean? What is Christian faith really all about? And, and I shared this a few weeks ago, but our church comes out of a movement. We're, we're considered a non-denominational independent church, but we come out of a movement that's known as the Stone Campbell Movement. And it was a unity movement that, that you know, goes back a, a long ways. And, and one of their slogans, one of their earliest slogans, this, this was their slogan. We're not the only Christians, we're Christians only. That Stone and Campbell, the two guys who kind of started it, they were both Presbyterian ministers and they got kind of tired of all the, the division within all of these different denominations. And they said, you know what, we're going to drop all these denomination affiliations and we just want to be known by our commitment to Christ. And so they weren't trying to criticize other denominational churches and saying, you're not Christians, you're not. They were saying, listen, we're, we're not the only Christians. We're not. There are other people out there who are Christians who use all these different denominational names and that's, that's totally okay. But we want to define ourselves by what faith is supposed to be defined by, Jesus Christ. And so this is what we're trying to do. So please don't ever hear anything that I say as like a critique or attack against another church or, or other Christians. That's, that's not my point at all. Here at FCC, we're, we're not the only Christians. We're not. But we just want to be Christians only. We want to get rid of what has complicated and weighed down so much of, of faith in, in, like Beck points out, in Protestantism, in, in the Western world, in even our, our nation, even in our country. Because we've become what, what my friend Todd Clark calls as Jesus plus people. That we've taken Christianity and we've made it about Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus this behavior. Jesus plus this attitude. Jesus plus this outlook. Jesus plus this political affiliation. Jesus plus this morality. And again, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying all those other things aren't significant. I'm not saying they're not important. But what I'm saying is that Jesus comes first. And faith will never make sense. It will never function. It will never work unless Jesus and Jesus alone comes first. Unless we're pursuing him. Then Jesus said it this way. He said, seek first God's kingdom and then everything else will fall in line. And all these things will be added unto you. So Christian faith at its core is about pursuing Jesus. And so that's, that's what we want to get back to. That's what we're trying to get back to is that it seems so simple, but that's the foundation of what faith is all about. Because pursuing Jesus, it's through his, his presence in our lives, through God's presence in our lives, that we experience all of that other stuff. Now, there's another thing that, that Richard Beck shares that I think is a, is a powerful truth. And I think this is, this is really important. I think it's super important. Because as much as, as, much as the, the, the transformation of faith is a result of, of the God in us, I mean, that's what we've said, right? That, that we pursue Jesus and, and, and transformation, character, development, morality, all that stuff is a result of what God does in us. Sometimes that makes faith seem like really passive, like, oh, it's not about me. It's, it's everything that God does. And, and it's true. It originates with God. It's all about God. But faith does require something from us. If we want to experience growing faith in our life, it does require something from us. And here's the truth that Richard Beck points out. He says that what forms us is what we give our attention to. Ultimately, as people, what forms us on the inside, what forms our, our character, what forms our morality, what forms our lifestyles, what forms our values, is where we give our attention. Now, there's a lot of things in life that we can't control. We can't always control what happens in a lot of areas in our life. But the one thing we do have some control over at all times is where we put our attention. And one of the reasons that we find ourselves in, in, in our life, that we find ourselves in trouble, that we get into the messed up situations in, in our life, at work, in our relationships, in our families, is because too often we end up giving our attention to the wrong places or to the wrong people. And instead of putting our attention on the things that matter, on our, our, our families, on our boyfriends, on our girlfriends, our significant others, our spouses, on our, on our children, 
we end up putting it on other people or on other places. And so we're never really present and we're never there and we're focused on this other thing or that other thing or this other person. And what Beck is getting at here is he's saying, listen, wherever you put your attention, that's ultimately what shapes you. That's ultimately what forms you. And so this goes back to part of the reason there's such like big division within our culture and even big division, even within the context of the church, that there's there's political division and, and racial division, all that stuff that's happening in our culture, but it's also very real and powerful. And in some ways, I think it's even more divisive within the church. And part of the reason that has become so divisive is because as people, like stop and think about what we're giving our attention to. And what ends up happening is we give all of our attention to to websites or to commentators or to to news outlets that back up whatever our view is. I'm not going to watch this other side because they're wrong there, so I'm just going to watch this one. So on one side, you have people who are just giving all their time and attention to this, this, this. And on the other side, you have people who are giving all their attention to this, this, this. And that's what's forming us. We're being formed by these polar opposite things. And then you wonder, why can't we come together? Why can't we find unity? Why can't there be peace? Why can't there be love? Because as people, we're being formed by these two polar opposite things that have convinced us that the other one is the enemy. See, what what Beck is getting at here, this is what we see that's like playing out all over our culture, all over our society. Experiencing growing faith is ultimately about making sure that our attention is consistently on Jesus. In, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul talks about taking every thought captive for Christ. That's what it says, take every thought. And what he means by that is, what he means by that is, is it sounds really like theological and weird, but it's really practical because here's what Paul means by that. If you ever gone to the grocery store and you, you just have a few things you need to get? And so, you know, there's long lines there. So you think, I'm going to go through the self-checkout. And you go through the self-checkout, and there's usually about four different little stations in the self-checkout. And whenever you're in a hurry, whenever you have one or two things, the self-checkout stands are always full. And when you look up, the first thing you notice is everyone in the self-checkout stand has like a, a cart full of stuff. It's not, just like, it's not just like one or two things. Like, no, here's a cart full of stuff. And then the, the people who are up there have apparently never used self-checkout before because they're going so incredibly slow. Like they pull one thing out of the cart and then they're looking like, I have to find the little code. Where's the code? Um, oh, there it is. And then they try to scan it and it doesn't scan and try to scan it and doesn't scan and try to scan it and doesn't scan. And find, beep. Okay. Then they set it there. Then they go for the next. And it's like painful. And then when it comes time for them to finally pay, like they get out their wallet and it's like they're having trouble finding the card and, and they're, they stick the card in there and the card doesn't work and you are just going crazy. Because as you're standing there in line, you're thinking, listen, I gotta get home, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta go to work, I gotta get the kids. All I need to do is buy this one thing of milk. Just please, for the love of God, let me get up there and buy my milk. But the people are going so incredibly slow. See, here's, here's what Paul means when he says take every thought captive to Christ. In that moment, if you're in that moment, if what you're giving attention to is this person who is so slow and should not even be in this line and you shouldn't even be in that line unless you only have a couple things. and like, If you're giving your attention to that, then ultimately what you're giving attention to is, is anger because you're angry at that person. This person's dumb, this person's selfish, this person's stupid, and that's what you're thinking about, and that's where your attention is. And so that is what's forming you. You're giving your attention to anger. Anger is what's forming you. You are then becoming an angry person. What Paul's saying is, what if in that moment when you're there, and you are frustrated with that person, and you can be frustrated with people, that's okay, we're frustrated with each other. It's, 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 but what if in that moment, instead of giving your attention to the, the frustration or the anger that you feel, what if you give your attention to the fact that God loves that person? That that person is a child of God? And, and literally, it sounds weird, but what if you just took a moment and said, you know what, I'm just going to say a little prayer for that person. God, that is your child, and, and I'm a little frustrated that they picked this line because it seems like kind of a selfish thing to do, but God, I don't know what's going on, so I just I pray that you're with them. See, so your mind, your attitude, your heart are going to be in an entirely different place at the end of that experience because during that experience, instead of giving your attention to your anger, 
you give your attention to Jesus. See, this, this is what Beck is getting at. What we give our attention to is what forms us. Dallas Willard, who was a professor at USC, was a great philosopher and theologian, he said this. He said, the first act of love is always the giving of attention. See, faith grows as we begin to intentionally choose to give our attention to Jesus and as we do it consistently. And the thing about it is, it's hard at first. It's hard. But the more you do it over time, the easier it becomes and the more natural it becomes. Well, well, what we did, and we did this uh, as a staff a while back, is we actually went through and we tried to like map out a strategy for how faith grows and develops over time. Because we wanted as a staff to understand, but we also wanted you to understand. We wanted all of us who are part of FCC to understand what's the process that faith grows through as it, as it grows. Because again, it starts with little things. But then it grows and it grows. And so we've put together kind of this, it, it, it's a model. Now, like all models, this is not a perfect model. It's not. So don't get caught up, because I'm going to lay this out for you. As, as we, I go through this, don't get caught up and like, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what about this? There are always exceptions. Things don't always work out perfect. But this is kind of a basic model for understanding, hey, here's kind of how faith grows and, and, and how faith, faith develops. And again, I'm not saying this is like the best model in the world. There are other, other models out there. But this is the one that for us was the most helpful in understanding the processes people we go through and how our faith grows and develops. And so faith kind of starts off on this first level where you're what, what we call an explorer. An explorer is someone who's literally, you're just starting to engage with God and you're exploring God in church. And this can look like any one of a million different things. You could attend a church online. You could go to a church in person. You could go check out different churches. You could read books. You could listen to podcasts. You could watch things on YouTube. You could go to smaller church gatherings. You could go to classes. You could go to seminars. Literally, it's anything that you do that you're just kind of like checking it out. What is, what is this whole thing all about? You're, you're learning new things. You're asking questions. You're expressing doubts. You can be discussing it with other people, conversations you have. You can be reading things. It's just anything that you do where you're just kind of checking it out. You, you haven't made any commitment. There's no commitment. There's no dedication. It's just, hey, I'm test driving this whole thing. I'm just like, I'm just poking my head around and trying to figure all this out. Now from there, the next step, if your faith continues to grow and develop, you become what, what the, the word that we came up with was member. Because the thing about faith is this, and this is when you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, is faith was never designed to be a solo thing. When God created people, he created faith communities. In the Old Testament, it's the people of Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. And so you can't, there's no way to live out Christian faith in isolation. You have to be a c connected to, to a community of people. And, and it has to be at least a, a few different people. I mean, some people go to, I mean, there's churches that are like 50,000 people, and there's churches that are like five people, and it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just you have to be within a context of people. And so you become a member. You belong to that family. And, and belonging for us is more than just, I'm going to go weekend after week out. No, it's you make a commitment. You make a commitment to that family and to, to Jesus. And so this is, this is really kind of what, what membership is all about. And, and, and we actually here at FCC, we have a formal membership where people commit to, hey, this, this, you know, this, this is my church and, and I'm going to follow Jesus. You know, Jesus is my God, FCC is my church. That's that next level. Because again, it's an, it's an increased commitment. Now from there, when you go on from member, the, the next step, kind of the next phase as, as faith grows and develops is what we call partner. Because when you get to the partner level, this is when you begin investing in the mission. Because what you see in the New Testament is Jesus makes it clear that, that faith is very missional. That yeah, it's about my connection with God and what he's doing in me. But ultimately what God's doing in me is he's sending me into the world. Jesus sends the church. Jesus is always sending people. And so the, 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 the next step of commitment after it's like, no, this is where, this is why, you know, God, Jesus is my Lord and FCC is my church and, or whatever church you commit to and this is where I belong and this is where I go. But now, hey, the church is up to something in the world. God is up to something in the world. He's restoring and redeeming all creation and I have a part to play in that. And so I, it's up to me now to invest in that mission, in the mission of the church that I'm now a part of. 
And investing is about our resources. Investing is about our time, our energy, and our talent. It's taking it and saying, hey, I'm going to pour a lot of who I am into helping the church accomplish its mission in the world because this is what God is up to. It's about expanding God's kingdom. It's about renewal. It's about restoration. It's about forgiveness. It's about life. And then kind of the, the last phase, the, the, the fourth phase, is what we call developer. And a developer is this recognition that, that it's not just about like, it's not just about giving my resources or my time, my talent and energy to get things done. The ultimate goal of the church is not to get things done. The ultimate goal of the church is people. The church exists for people. Part of the problem churches, churches make sometimes, and, and we've been guilty of this too in the past, is you value programs over people. No, it's about what we do. It's about the event. No, no, no. It's about the people. Programs exist. Events exist to serve people. A church is ultimately about developing people. And, and, and as our faith continues to grow, what happens is we get to this place where as God is developing me, I'm helping to develop others. So it's not just about me. So yeah, I'm investing my, my time and everything. I'm a part of the family. But being a part of the family and, and my investment is about other people. And, and it's not just, hey, I'm giving or I'm serving. It's like, no, it's the time I'm spending pouring into other people, loving other people, serving other people, engaging other people. And so the, the thing that we most loved about this, this model of faith development is ultimately, ultimately, what this is all about is it's about growing levels of commitment. And again, not everybody moves from one to another. Sometimes people may start here and go back here. And the cool thing about this model is you don't ever leave any of these behind. The point is not to go from here to here to here to here. The point is you keep adding these things. That, that hopefully you never stop exploring God and exploring the church. I, I don't. I still ask questions. I still read books. I still listen to podcasts of things I agree with or things I disagree with because I'm curious and I want to know. So just because I become a member doesn't mean I leave behind being an explorer. No, I'm an explorer and I'm a member. And now, you know what? I moved to, to partner, but I'm still a member and I'm still an explorer. And so even if you go out of order, even if you start here, then it's like, okay, well, I can still go back and do this. The whole point is that we're doing all of these. That, that when, we're, when we're plugged in, when we're doing all of these, when all of these things are true of us, when we are explorers, members, partners, and developers, this is when we are growing to our fullest potential. And when we're really dialed into the, the missional nature of, of what God is doing in our world. And again, I'm not like, the, the, you, you could shoot holes in this model. That, that's not the point. The point is we wanted to understand, hey, what are the steps we take? So when it comes to us as people, we can kind of understand, hey, what does my next level of commitment look like? Because again, we said that what you give your attention to is what forms you. And so the thing about growing levels of commitment is growing levels of commitment requires more and more attention to be put on God and to be put on other people. So you think about being an explorer is there's, there's not a lot of commitment here. So I can put my attention here, there. But, but when I go to the next level, when I become a member, well, this, this is now, now I've got to, I'm making the choice to intentionally put more attention onto other people and onto God. And this requires more attention because now you're getting into resources and time and energy. And this requires even more attention because it's this personal investment. And so growing levels of commitment requires more and more attention to be placed upon God and other people. And so the reason that, that we wanted to share this with you today is, is again, this is not, we, yeah, we developed this, but this isn't just for something as, for us as a, a staff or even a church leadership. We wanted you to know this because, and this is, this is key, this is important. Here's why it's important that you understand this. And I'm going to put this on the screen so that, that, that you can get this. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I go on, this is also part of our, our, our mission, that being an explorer and being a member is about experiencing grace, and being a partner and developer is about discovering purpose. This is ultimately how we accomplish our mission. But now, the next one is, here's why this is really important. You are responsible for your own spiritual growth. And I don't say that like to guilt trip you or to lecture you. Because here's, here's one of the biggest problems that I see like in, in kind of Western Christianity, in American Christianity, and, and it, 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 I think it's the fault of the church ultimately, is we have made Christian faith consumeristic. It's a consumer faith. And so we've kind of adopted this, this mentality that, well, no, the, the church is there to grow my faith. That's why the church exists. I go to church so that my faith will grow and and so we put on other people or we put on, you know, the church as an, as an institution, like you're responsible for my spiritual growth. Or in the case of our families, you're responsible for my kids' spiritual growth. But 
the problem is you can't give away in your life what only you can do. Because no one, no one, no church, no institution, no person, no pastor, I can't make you grow spiritually because I cannot make you increase the amount of attention you give to Jesus and to other people. I can't force you to, to make a greater commitment and focus more. You have to do that on your own. Now, please, please hear me. The church as a community, the church as an institution, as an organization, has a significant role to play when it comes to spiritual growth and, and spiritual faith development in our life. We have a, 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 a very valuable role to play. But my point is that if you want to experience growing faith, you have to take the reins of that. You have to make the choice that no, I and I alone am responsible for my growth. It's not the church's responsibility. It's not my responsibility. It's not my spouse's responsibility. It's yours. The only way you will ever experience in growing faith is when you choose to own it. Yes, other people, yes, the church has a part to play, but it has to be yours. Part of the reason that Christianity is so spiritually shallow is because we have tried to give to other people what only we can do. See, if you and I want to experience growing faith, it's, it, it starts with us. We have to make the commitment. We have to make the choice. We have to own it. And see, experiencing growing faith, the way Paul describes it in Galatians, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Experiencing that requires that we live our lives in certain rhythms. That there's things that we have to do in order to cultivate a life that is that, that gives our attention to Jesus, that puts our focus on Jesus, that helps us learn to, to remain with Jesus or abide or dwell with Jesus. And the, the thing about it, and this is really important, when it comes to Christian spiritual formation, when it comes to, to faith development, it's not a one-size-fits-all program. A lot of times people stand up there and say, well, just do this and your faith will grow. Just do that and your faith will grow. No, no, that's stupid. Each one of us is so, so, so unique and so different that ultimately in order to experience growing faith in your life, you have to find what is it that works for you. Now, there's some key things like the Bible is an important part of, of faith and prayer is an important part of faith, but there's a thousand different ways to do those things. There's a thousand different ways to read the Bible. There's a thousand different ways to pray. And so when someone stands up there and just says, just pray and read your Bible and your faith will grow. No. You've got to figure out, how do I read the Bible in a way that builds my faith? Because it may be different from someone else's. How do I pray in a way that builds my faith? Because how you do it may be very different from someone else. It's a matter of like tweaking it and experimenting and find what works for you in this season of your life. The next two weeks, we're going to finish up this series by talking about some of these specific practices and rhythms. We're gonna, some of them are communal, the things we do together as a church. Some of them are individual, the things we do in our own life. And so we're going to like kind of talk through. But before we even do that, I, I need you to know that, 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 again, there's a bunch of different exercises, practices, disciplines, whatever you want to call them. But the goal is not that you do all of them. The goal is literally that you do one or two that helps you to abide with Jesus, to helps you to keep your attention focused on Jesus so that grows and develops. And so I, I, before we get into the next couple of weeks defining the specifics, here's the one thing that I want you to remember. What forms us is what we give our attention to. Ultimately, the goal isn't the specific thing you do, the specific practice or discipline or rhythm that you live your life in. Ultimately, the important thing is that we keep our attention on Jesus. Because as we keep our attention and focus on Jesus, that's what forms us to be people who are defined by love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. And be very, very clear, because this is important, that when I say keep your attention on Jesus, I'm not asking you to keep your attention on the things that are associated with Jesus. See, sometimes we, we focus more on the things of Christianity, which goes back again to, to the, the, the morals or the behaviors or the, the politics. No, those those. Those are the things that people like ascribe to Christianity. Those are the things that some even Christians would say, well, this is, no, that's, no, that's the things of Christianity, which may or may not even be Christian things. I'm talking about the focus has to be on Jesus himself, the person of Jesus, God in the flesh, who died and rose again and ascended up into heaven and is sitting there reigning. That's where faith is. That's the foundation of faith. And when we keep our attention there, that's when our faith grows. That's when we experience transformation and new life.